All right, everybody, we're back here on the Sepchik Show. Special guest in house, Timothy Benz. It's a pleasure to have you here today, brother. Thank Before you. we uh, get deeper in today, um, we do pray into the episode. Uh, I also want to just thank our sponsors, Garden Pass Landscapes, right out of Damascus, Maryland, our hometown. Thank you for what you do to make this show possible. We also want to thank our gym, MMA and Sport, in Damascus, Maryland as well. Thank you for you know, sponsoring this show. Glad to be part of the team. Glad for what we have there, that family have. MMAandsport.com. And, of course, Lever Dreams. We have Doug behind camera making this show happen. The audio, the visuals. This man has been truly blessed, and he's using what he's been anointed to do to make this show possible. Um, like I said, you guys, we have Timothy Bence in-house today right here in studio to just share you know what he's been what he's been doing for the Lord for most of his life. And before we get into that, we're going to pray in. Yahweh, Lord, just thank you for bringing this brotherhood, this fellowship together today to talk about Christ, talk about what's going on in our world, Lord God. We just ask that you just lead this conversation today, not just for ourselves in the studio, but for the listeners today, that we, need to, that we hear what you need to be spoken today, Lord God. And we just ask that you be all over the, all, all, with all the families that are listening, Lord God, the children. <laughs> with everybody going, you know, through the things that they're going through in this world right now, that, that they, they find the truth about you and find the healing they need. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, Timothy, let's get right into it, man. Uh, there's just so many things that, you know, I, just one real fast audience, there's people listening today that you've, you know, you've, you've heard podcasts he's been on and you've if you've been anything like me and Ryan, you've been hit pretty hard with, you know, some of the words that Timothy have, has shared. There's so many topics that you can speak on, but there's a few today that, uh, you know, when we asked you, like, what's been on your heart today? What do you feel that you're led to share to us? Because you are a man that is after Christ, that is following Yahweh. So where, where do you feel like we need to start this conversation today? What is truly hitting you as, as we sit in this room? You know, one of the reasons why I'm here is the, the sort of a protocol I've walked out for most of my life, and it took me 20 years to figure it out. Um, after I sort of got an understanding of what it looked like, I started paying attention to it more. But uh, I've had two things that were really important. One was understanding first fruits, that God sometimes would lead me to do something, and it would be small and unnoticed and unadvertised, and nobody realized I did it, maybe just one or two people that got something out of it. But it wasn't a typical ministry type thing, even though that's what I was called to do. But I was obeying Jesus on some little small level that didn't seem to be that big of a thing, just knowing he said to do it, so I did it. Mm. And then walk away from it going, well, that was fun, it was fruitful, I don't know what that was all about, but I did what I understood to do. You know? And it took me a while before I realized that he was leading me to do first fruits, that my life actually was going to go that route in many places where I would live it twice. I would live it out once with a strict level of obedience on some small thing that nobody else would do. Mm. And then I'd get to come back later and see the fruit of those prayers and those labors and others being successful in the kingdom of God on some level, and then I would get to reap. Amen. You know? And we're at that stage now where I feel like I've got about 28 of those things that I've lived out in the last 30 years, mm. and now I'm returning to some of the places and saying, okay, God, nobody knows me here. I've not done this in a sense that I'm not brought in to be a speaker at a church necessarily, even though I'm willing to do that. Mm. I'm coming in because God cares about the people in the land of this place, mm. you know, and he's got something he's about to do that we've not seen before. Amen. So I began to ponder along the way, what does the kingdom of God look like, you know? We talk about it in Scripture. Sometimes we read the verses, but what does the kingdom of God actually look like? When the king is present, everything changes. You know? Everything changes. You know? Amen. And for the most part, we have built ministries or we've built businesses or we've built cities, but we've left the king out. You know? We don't even understand the kingship of Jesus because we're a democracy. Mm. And I'm not saying anything negative about democracies. I love my country, but we're going to have to have a major transition in how we understand God because he is a king. You know? 
And our government will have to come into understanding of that. All the nations of the earth will. You know? So the closer we get to that manifesting fully and his glory filling the whole earth, the more I'm going to have to understand what my role is in the kingdom. You know? And what I realized that one of the mistakes of my youth was I was taught to just preach and teach and try to get people saved and to, to pray God into what I was doing instead of to pray me into what God was doing. Mm. And when I made that switch of saying, God, I don't want to do anything anymore unless you're doing it. And I don't want to say anything anymore unless you're saying it. You know? That was Jesus' secret to success. Then I started realizing the earth was important to the Lord too. And it's not something that I, I'm not saying that as an ecologist, I'm saying that God has a design, that, a blueprint that we've not understood very well. You know? So let's take Maryland, for example. It's one of the original 13 colonies. Well, why is that important? Today we forget. It's been over 200 years, so we don't really understand what God was looking at when he only looked down at this raw land and it was not fully settled and inhabited. And there was a nat few natives here, but it wasn't anything like what we see today. And yet God saw cities here. He saw a nation being birthed out of here. So there's some kind of an anointing in the land to give birth to a nation. Yeah. Well, if we've done it once, what would that look like if we did the next birthing for the kingdom of God, the mm -hmm. nation of heaven that has to come forth, mm -hmm. where every man, woman, and child comes into the place that God created them for? Yeah. Right now, we've got a wonderful nation, like second to none, I think, in the earth, but we haven't seen the kingdom of God fully yet. And it will outdo anything man has ever come up with. You know? So I'm not trying to say anything negative about secular stuff, except that it's falling short of God's glory. You know? yes. So when I live here, if I got a home and I got a nice farm, or I've got a business, or I got a you know whatever I'm doing to earn a living and to makes me want to live here, we really sometimes don't understand the land from God's perspective. So we just turn it into whatever we want. Instead of saying, God, what does a blueprint look like when you created this place? You know, what did you have in mind? What are you doing here that no one sees? You know? So one example of this in Scripture is when Moses was, you know, fled Egypt and he's hanging out with the Midianites and he's married a, a shepherdess, you know, and he's found some refuge. But he's living with some people that seem to be pretty righteous and godly. But he, at that point, he must have just felt lost because he didn't know what he was really going to do with his life. He fled Egypt, mm. you know, and he didn't feel like he could go back. But he starts seeing a fire on top of a mountain. It's just a little old campfire-looking thing, but it's a tree burning that's not getting consumed. Well, that's different. You, know, you don't see that every day. Mm. What's funny about that passage is he says something to his family like well, what is that you know and they all knew what it was oh that's when god is sitting on the mountain you know but then none of them went up there you know? <laughs> they saw him from afar but none of them wanted to make the trip up i don't know why maybe they were scared maybe they thought it was too holy maybe they didn't i mean whatever the reasons were he he, he was talking to the priest of midian and they did not go up into the fire Mm. You know, but they were able to tell him what it was. So they had some understanding of God, but they were falling short of actually being in his glory. Wow. You know? They might have had a nice little temple or a nice little altar or doing something that they thought was the right things to do, but they were not in the glory. It was up there. You know? And Moses just, it, it's a fascinating little scripture. In, in English it says that Moses turned aside and said, I'm going to go see what this is. Yeah. In Hebrew, it means he stopped what he was doing and he went where he had never gone before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, he was a good shepherd by that time. He knew how to care for the sheep. That's hard for a shepherd to do. If you leave the sheep, they might get eaten by the wolves. You know? He's got a wonderful family, and he's got a wife, and he's, uh, he loves, it, it looks like he loves his family at that point, and he's got to leave his household for a little bit. He doesn't know when he goes up in that fire if he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. 
There was a, a, a scripture that they all understood. We see it as a scripture today. Back then, they just had a belief that if you ever saw God face to face, you weren't going to live. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, he's about to risk that. You know? That means he was willing to die to know God. Mm -hmm. you know? And everybody else just wanted to see him from afar. Now, my question is that he goes up on that mountain, and my question when I began pondering that, I, I, I dialogued with Jesus a little bit about this because I wanted to understand what made him go up there. Well, there's one thing he already knew. He had heard a prophecy about his life, that he was born to be a deliverer, and he only tried to deliver two guys, and that got him in trouble. Yeah. He killed a couple of guys to try to deliver some people that needed help. And that got him in big trouble. So he probably gave up on that prophecy, saying, oh, that's never gonna happen. You know, I don't know if that was God or not, because boy, it sure got me in trouble when I was in Egypt. He had no idea that he was gonna go back to Egypt and bring a whole nation out. You know? All he knew was everything in his life looked messed up. He was a slave, he was in the wrong spot, he was out of favor with the king. He had lost his family there. He never got to grow up with his mothers and brothers and sisters. He never got to really embrace his own identity. He had to become an Egyptian to survive when he was in Egypt. And even if it's true, I mean, I love the Ten Commandments movie, so even if it's true that he met his mother somewhere in there, he, she didn't get to raise him, you know, just barely, as a nurse mother, not as his mother, you know. She got to raise him as a slave. So I would submit to most people in America, the children that have grown up in our lifetime, we think we're the land of the free, but we've grown up slaves mm -hmm. because we don't know how to live in the kingdom of God yet, and everything in the world's falling short of it. Yeah. And so even though I might be free in one sense, I'm not in many. I've got debt. I've got a, a loss of identity. Lots of people don't know who their family is, or we don't know, at least, at least even if you know mom and dad, you might not know who your grandfather was. We don't have to go very far back in America to lose our identity. Mm. You know, where did I come from? I don't know. I've got a little Irish, a little, you know, a little French, whatever. We don't understand identity because somewhere in our lifetime there was a disconnect with where we were. And so that's similar to Moses. But whatever he saw when he saw that bush burning, it was something miraculous because he saw a tree burning, but it wasn't being consumed. Now, I think about the Feast of Tabernacles, and most people, most Christians in America, and even a lot of Jews, they don't understand the Feast of Tabernacles because it just looks like a week-long celebration, but it's supposed to be a week of tabernacling with God and friends and family. You know, and even involving the strangers, if, if they're nearby, you invite them into your, your booth. But God's supposed to show up in that feast. The king's supposed to come to town. You know? And you don't know when you're going to get your 10, 15 minutes with the king. You just know if you build your booth and you know, celebrate the feast and the goodness of God, somewhere in the week, God's going to show up. You know? Before there was a feast of tabernacles given as an instruction to Israel, God created his own on top of a mountain, pulling the boughs of a tree down into fire without letting it be consumed. He built a tent so that he could be seen. Because mm -hmm. you know? he wants to be discovered by every man, woman, and child. Mm -hmm. he, now listen, he wants to be discovered. He wants to be found. Mm -hmm. you know? He wants us to seek him and promised if you do, you will find him. Mm -hmm. you know? He's not some mystery that doesn't want to be touched or heard or known. You know? He's not just somebody to believe in that gave you a benefit and then you can't know him. You know? He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your father. He wants to be your husband. He wants to marry his people and bring them into his household. And boy, does he know how to raise a family. Mm. You know? But we're so out of touch with him as a father because we're like the Midianites. We, we know God exists, but, but it's still a bit of a mystery to most people. I've never seen him. Many people have never heard him. So he's afar off. He's over there somewhere doing something, and we don't know 
how to get to him. We just believe in him a little bit. But when Moses went up the mountain, he not only saw a bush burning, the, the word of God says it was the angel of the Lord, the angel of the name. I think that was Jesus himself. I could be wrong in that. That's not a thus saith the Lord. But I think that when when the word says the angel of the Lord has the name in it, it's probably talking about him. But he sees it, and and uh, and suddenly he can hear God for the, probably the first time in his life. God says, "Take off your shoes. The place you're standing is holy." Well, was it the mountain that was holy, or was it the presence, or both? You know. I don't think we understand this idea that God might have places on the earth that he has sanctified with his presence. You know? All through history, we have a lot of different religions and different people groups that have a sacred spot you know, where they found God. And I'm not trying to endorse all of that. Some of that's idolatrous. But people all through history have tried to find this place where they can connect with God. You know? And we don't often know why certain spots facilitate that. In Scripture, there's a lot of times where God tells a prophet, go over here, like, go over here to the river Kabar, and then I'll speak to you. Well, why does the guy, he just heard that from God. Why does he have to get up and go over there to hear the rest? Because there's something about that spot that facilitates what God wants to talk to him about. We tend to build things wherever we want them and do whatever we want with land, and we don't really inquire the Lord very much about it. And so we probably, you could probably make a good case that many of our cities are probably not following the blueprint that God had for them. Mm. You know? Even though we might have done a wonderful job and built some amazing things. You know? So that's okay. In some respects, God winks his eye at it. But if God wants something there, and we put something else there, it may not bring the presence of God. You know? and so I started exploring this out, saying, God, you know, as a child, I had many, many encounters with the Lord, and I realized that God was being so gracious to me, and I really don't know why I heard his voice for the first time when I was only two years old. You know? And I was in a place called Fort Worth, Texas, but it was like in Fort Worth, we were just, my family was just living in a little house that my dad rented because he was going to seminary there. You know? And in the backyard of that house, I was swinging on a swing, just enjoying the day. I wasn't looking for God. You know? I was two years old. I was just playing in the backyard like a toddler would. My brother was up in a tree. He was four years old. And suddenly Jesus sat down on the swing next to me and started talking to me. And I knew instantly he's the one that made me. He didn't have to tell me that. I just knew he's the one that made me. And I've noticed this about the spiritual realm, about heavenly realms, that you always know who someone is when you're in the spirit. It's hard to know when you're in the natural. (laughs) But he told me who I was. He told me what my name meant. Well, I I sort of knew my name. I mean, I knew what my name was, but I didn't know what it meant until Jesus told me. And I didn't know why that happened there. Why did he come to my backyard? You know, We were only in that city for two years while my dad went to seminary, and then we moved to Oklahoma City. But in that moment, my life was changed because I encountered the living God in an unexpected moment. You know. Now, lots of kids probably would have just got up and ran inside you know, because it's kind of scary when you something that you've never seen or heard happens. You know, I could have called out to mom because I didn't know who this was talking to me. I didn't do any of that. I just listened and asked questions. You know, there was a little flower that was b- between my feet. And I was being real careful when I was swinging, trying not to kick that flower. You, you know how when you swing back and forth, you kind of usually stir up the, mm-hmm. the grass goes away and all you get is a little dirt right there. There was this little flower growing out of the bare dirt. And, and I loved that little flower. I don't know why, I just thought it was beautiful and I didn't want to kill it. So I was spread my feet out and I was trying not to, to, to catch it when I was swinging. And when Jesus sat down, the first thing he said to me, you love that flower, don't you? He saw that I was saving its life. Lots of kids probably would have just kicked it and not thought about it. 
And I didn't necessarily have a concept that I love flowers or that I love art, you know, greenery or stuff. I didn't really, I never thought about it much, but he was right. He saw that I was protecting the flower. My first encounter in the heavenly realms, when I saw the heavens, that flower had been transplanted into a field in heaven. And Jesus said to me, I saw that you loved it, so I gave it an eternal existence. Now, whether you believe that or not, I don't care. Mm -hmm. It's in my field. You can build your own, Mm -hmm. you know. But in the place where I like to encounter God, in the, the place that I'll dwell for eternity, that flower is still growing. And it's growing, uh, what I learned from that, it's growing there because I loved it. You know? And man, for a two-year-old to learn from God how to love, you know? and that if you love somebody, you might be doing more than just giving them a nice feeling. You might be doing something eternal. And to love a place is important too. So lots of people love their city. Lots of people love their family. But then there's a disconnect with lots of people in those things too. From that little experience, when God explained to me, this is what your name means. This is what I created for you for. This is why I'm revealing myself to you. I discovered that where I was standing must be something important. Uh, To me, it was just a backyard before Jesus showed up. 20 years later, I went back to that address. My father was dying. I took him back to seminary just to just to remember some things and talk to him a little bit. We drove down there together. Uh, he was sick, and we thought he was going to die within a few months. And we went and we knocked on that address just to see who was living there now. <laughs> and the gentleman that answered the, the door um, thought we were there to try to buy his house or something. He thought we were there for something he didn't want to talk to us about, so he was a little bit gruff. And then when I said to him, I said, I just wanted to come and see the backyard because when I was two years old, I had an encounter with Jesus in that backyard. Immediately, tears started streaming down his face. And he's like, well, he still hangs out in that backyard. I'm like, what what do you know that I don't? He said, every time I go back there, it's like the presence of God is there. Now, was it there before we moved into that house? I don't know. Has it lingered because God showed up the day I was there? I don't know. But I know that when you cooperate with God, when you engage with him, you might establish something that benefits the next generation also. Mm -hmm. And so I I suddenly sort of switched in my understanding of the earth a little bit because I realized, wow, God does like to hang out at certain spots sometimes. And that doesn't mean he's visible to everybody or doesn't mean he's doing something phenomenal. He's just there waiting for somebody to talk to him and to fall in love with him and to respond back. So this was, what I believe, the same type of thing that Moses experienced when he saw the burning bush. He wasn't seeing something that other people didn't know was available, but he engaged with it. You know, He went up there and had a conversation with God. And then he took the presence of God with it, you know, he had this promise from God when he was given his assignment to go back to Egypt that, that I will go with you. you know? So it's not just I can have an encounter over there and then I've got a journey back there every time I want to have that encounter again. It's like once I've met God, he wants us to become his temple mm. and he wants to dwell in us and he wants to go everywhere we go. Amen. And he wants to transform everything that we touch and everything that we do. Well, from that point forward, um, just looking at those two things as similar, I didn't see a burning bush, but I encountered the same God that Moses encountered, you know. And it transformed a little two-year-old brain and heart into I've got to pursue God with all my spirit, soul, and body, you know. I don't understand it all yet, but I'm going after it because he loves me, Mm -hmm. you know. I knew I knew very little beyond that, except that my, the meaning of my name was chosen of God, blessed by your Creator, stretch out the right hand and impart a blessing. That's the full meaning of my name. And I didn't understand how to stretch out my hand and impart a blessing because never really seen very many people blessing others up to that point. But that's what bents means, you know. Later, I discovered that. There's an unbroken um, 
evidence of someone serving God that we've traced back in the Bentz family back to uh, early 700 A.D. It goes further back than that, but we sort of are stuck, haven't gone any further back yet. And in every generation, somebody was preaching the gospel on the mission field, serving the, the body of Christ. Um, that's a heritage that's profound. And I realized when my, my father and I discovered that, I realized that I probably didn't hear God because I was madly pursuing him. I didn't see him because I'm so holy. He revealed himself to me because my forefathers blessed their house mm. and prayed for their children, and they sent the blessing forward. You know? And every generation picked it up, and somebody walked it out. Now, in most families, though, the vast majority of the United States especially, we've got some brokenness back there or some rascals in our house and somebody didn't walk with God or somebody messed us up. You know, Lots of people, the most traumatic stories I've ever heard came from someone in their own house. You know? What happens in that? It, it wars with what you were created for. It tries to rob you of that blessing. And I realize that the more I can understand what God wants to give to me and what he wants me to give to him, then the more I might be able to help somebody else find that too. And it's not about just getting saved, you know. It's about becoming who you are. Mm -hmm. So the word repent, I'm, I'm carrying this a little bit, and this all sort of relates to the land too. O on behalf of the land, on behalf of the people, on behalf of history, and things that have happened in even before we were alive, I've repented for more things than almost anyone I know. Yeah. Not because I did them, but because I see them as blocking his glory from all of us having it. You know? So let's get this rubble out of the way so the king can show up. Yeah. Repenting on behalf of the land or repenting on behalf of something that people have done has become a big part of my journey and it doesn't always make sense when I try to explain it to somebody else until you see the fruit of it you know? so just as an example thinking about Fort Worth it was a fort before it was a city there was a native village not very far it's no longer there there was a massacre in that site you know so before that spot was sanctified by the presence of God, there was some bad history that happened in that area. And part of what God does is he'll sometimes lead sons and daughters of his to a spot so you can just dwell there. And while you're there, you're imparting something to the land that heals it. Mm -hmm. you know, you're imparting something to the place that changes its future. We can't always fix the past in the sense that you can't go back in time and prevent it from happening, but we can go fix the effect of it mm -hmm. if we pray what God is praying. And so learning to lift iniquity off of the land and learning to drive it out of the people or out of a city is something that's been a part of my journey. And uh, right now I'm, I'm, I'm in Maryland for that very <laughs> purpose, that I believe that this city has an anointing to transform the whole nation and it's kind of like a key. Uh, I don't know if that's the right term, but it, even the way it looks to me, it looks like a master key. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be put into the right spot so that we begin to resonate with God and do what he's doing. And then as our hearts turn in this part of the country, I think a large part of the whole nation will turn. Mm -hmm. And the next generation is going to figure this out. And when they figure this out, we're going to have a move of God like the earth has never known mm -hmm. you know, because it's time for it. Yes. You know, the world has gone about as far as it needs to go without God's help. Mm. And the glory of God is about to show up. And I'm just, I'm telling you, we are living at the best time mm -hmm. in the history of the earth because the glory of God is getting ready to fill up the nations of the world. Oh, but yeah. now what do we need to do? You know, if, if it's one thing to say the Bible says that's going to happen. It's another to consider it might be going to happen in our lifetime. Well, now what does God need me to do? Mm. You know, 
that's been a lot of what I've tried to impart to others is to at least consider that the things that God wants to do might sh- need to now take precedence over everything that you thought your life was supposed to be about. Mm-hmm. And even the word repent, we've been taught, or at least I was taught from Baptist upbringing, that repent means to stop sinning, turn around, and go the other way. Right. But the real meaning of the word repent from the ancient Hebrew means to return to being who you are. Wow. You know? Deep. It, it's not just stop sinning. It's stop sinning so that you can return to being who you were created to be. Mm-hmm. You know? Most people have no idea wow. what they really were created for. Mm-hmm. They're just trying to exist in the life the best they can. Yep. So I, I'm praying fervently for God to reveal to the next generation, especially in the children of our day, that he'll, he'll get face to face with them. He'll tell them who they are. Mm-hmm. He'll tell them what their name means. And he'll give them their, their purpose in life so that now we can do it with God's help and with his blessing. There's a lot more, but that's kind of a snapshot. Um, Let's go, uh, you know, off of that, you know, what do we need to be doing as people that call themselves Christians? What do Christians need to be doing to basically walk into that purpose that you're talking about? And even if that means turning away from certain things currently doing and involved with what, if we're in these times, what should we be seeing Christ followers doing right now? You know, when I was uh, a child, there's a couple of things that helped me a lot with that answer. One was um, I, I'd started hearing God just well enough to become a little bit dangerous. You know? <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> fun that <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't look like a normal kid, especially after that two-year-old and then mm-hmm. six years old I went deeper wow um, when I was six Jesus came into my bedroom and sat on my bed and talked to me all night long and and explained to me a lot about my future what some of the things that were going to happen in the earth while I was alive and what he wanted to do with me as well as with many nations and he sort of took me on a little journey uh, in the night just showing me the nations of the earth and the peoples of the earth and how much he loved them and how he wanted to reveal himself to them. And so I asked him that very question. I said, Jesus, what do you, you know, after, after a couple of hours of that, I was like, Jesus, what do you need me to do? You know, what can I do for you? I don't want to just see this stuff. Tell me what, how I can help. Mm-hmm. You know? and he's like, well, that's a good question. What do you want to do? I was like, well, I want to do whatever you're doing. <laughs> I didn't really know what to ask for, so that sounded like a good idea. And he's like, well, you know what you need to change first? You need to do two things. You need to get all fear out of your life. Mm. You know? yeah. Well, how do I do that? Because, you know, at six, you, you've got a few natural fears. You know? He's like, you need to get all fear out of your life, and you do that by making fear afraid. You know? He's like... Don't hesitate. Don't faint. Don't freeze. Run at it. Mm. I'm with you. You And you really overcome it by letting me love through you the way only I know how to do because perfect love casts out fear. So I said, you've got to learn to love unconditionally things that you normally wouldn't like or people you normally wouldn't like you need to love just like me so if you'll let me Mm. I'll just emanate from you my love and you're going to learn how to do that and fear will flee from you Mm. because it can't stand in the same room with love I said well why do I need to get rid of fear that sounds good but why do I need to you know, what is it that's bad about it? Because lots of my friends like to get scared. You know, we're at Halloween time. That was about the time I was having this conversation. Lots of my friends like that. We like the scary movies and stuff. He said, because I want to show you things in the heavenly realms, and I want you to deal with things in the spiritual realm. And if you don't deal with fear, you're not going to be able to go where I want to take you. you know? So a lot of the body of Christ is sort of stuck in doing spiritual things that we understand, and then we don't know how to go deeper sometimes with God. 
And so if we've never seen something before or if that's no, not the way that we've always done it in our church or if that's not the way my parents did it, then I sometimes don't know that that might be good. You know, It could be bad, but I don't know because I've never seen it before. Well, what are we going to do when God starts doing things that no eye has seen and no eye here has ever heard? How are we going to do that? You know, if we're afraid of normal stuff like healing the sick or opening wow. the blind eyes or raising the dead mm. or casting out a demon, how in the world are we going to go to where no eye has ever seen or no ear has heard what he's about to do? You know? How do we even pray that or prophesy that? Mm. You know? So his glory is going to increase on such an extent we're going to be astounded every day and in awe of what God decides to do that will be a surprise. That, well, we've never seen this before, but I know it's God because he's here with me. You know? I've got to be willing to go where others haven't gone before to have that. And so I, I just made a vow. I promised Jesus that if he would help me that I would not allow fear to have any root in my life. You know? mm-hmm. And I became fearless that day. Mm. You know? um, the next test of that, um, I didn't really think about it much. I worked on it. I didn't go to scary movies. I stopped doing Halloween. Still liked the fact that I, you could go out there and get candy. I got to admit, that sounded like a good thing. If we could do that at church instead of, you know, it's, it's like we ought to figure out how to do this. And it's in there. There's a thing called the Harvest Festival we, we should be doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but right. we because we've left out some of the things that God told his people to do, the world figures out a way to celebrate differently. And then it, and gotcha. then it sometimes gets us in trouble. Yes. And I think because we don't do the Feast of Tabernacles, the world came up with Halloween. Mm. And, uh, boy, I wish we would show the cities how to do the feast the way God wants. Mm. It's a citywide feast. It's a party in the streets. It's the king of glory showing up into every booth and introducing himself to every man, woman, and child. Why don't we do that instead mm. of, you know, demons and goblins and, and candy that's not, you know, maybe not good for you, although I sure liked it when I was a kid. <laughs> but. The idea of, of why do we celebrate these kinds of things when they become culturally acceptable, it's, I'm playing, please don't understand, please understand, I'm not saying that everything's bad with something just because God's not a part of it. Sometimes it really is an effort to do something fun with your kids or to do something fun in the city that's, that we do need that. But when something dark and evil creeps into it and we expose that to children, we have no idea where that's going to take them. Amen. Know? And it may ruin them for the rest of their life. Mm. You know? mm. So I, I realized that Jesus was delivering me from that before I even knew it was a problem. You know? wow. And then he made it easy for me to explain to others, like, well, I'm not celebrating Halloween, not because it's witches, but because I don't need to be afraid. You know? I've got the living God living inside me. What do I need to fear? So why do I want to feed fear? Mm. You know, then yeah. ne- the next thing was, well, first loving, secondly was getting ready to fear. And the next thing was the presence. You know? I had gone to church my whole life up to that point. And my mother says I never missed a day in church because even when I was in the womb, we were there every time the door was open. I had a wonderful, rich heritage of a godly family, you know. But I pondered a number of times, even as a child, why am I going to church and where was Jesus? I didn't sense the presence of mm. God there, and I know he's supposed to be, yeah. you know. Now, I'm not saying that in any way to be critical. I love the house of God. But I knew the difference because I had been in it. Mm. You know? And once you're in, once you're fully in the glory, then you know when you're not. Yes. You know? And so I, I started pondering that and praying that and asking God, where are you? Why are you not in your sanctuary? This, this place belongs to you. Is this not where you want to dwell? You promised to inhabit the praises of your people. Where are you? you know? mm. He says, well, I do pop in often but I can't remain 
when something is not right with me or when it's not built on my foundation mm. or when I ask for something and then they refuse. But I can't stand not seeing my bride, so I have to pop in on her once in a while. And the problem with that is we get those moments of glory that break open, those moments where everything hits it on the right cylinders and we know God was in the house, and then we don't know what we did right that time. So we try to repeat it, and it doesn't happen every Sunday. Mm. And what's really a travesty is when we bring the lost, and they're looking for God, and all they get is us. Mm. And they don't go home with Jesus wow. in them, you know, because we didn't know how to demonstrate his power or how to invite and release his glory. And so we end up just telling them some good things, mm. and sometimes that's enough. But for many people, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. They've got to s taste and see that he's good. They've got, to s they've got to get their prayer answered, and then they'll believe. So most of the miracles, I realized as I went through scriptures, most of the miracles God did in the New Testament especially were happening outside of the sanctuary. And it's not because he didn't love his house. It's because he was going where the people were broken. Mm. You know? And, and now I think he comes and does a lot of miracles in churches because we're just as broken as the rest of the world is. Oh, <laughs> but I, I'm trying to, to, to be positive on this. That, that when I say these things, I'm not trying to make people feel bad because we're falling short. I'm trying to say there's a, a solution to this. God has got a right. blueprint that he wants us to understand. Right. And we're not far from what he wants. We just have to say, okay, show me what to do and I'll do it. And so we have to agree with God invite him in and then whatever jesus says we need to do you know now that was simple instructions but it amazes me how many people have heard god and then didn't do it mm -hmm. and now there's a problem because sometimes we don't know it was god you know it takes a little bit of a journey to discover what he sounds like mm -hmm. and Make, I mean, when you first hear him, it's easy to think, I'm not sure if that was God or not. Mm -hmm. When Moses heard, I mean, I'm sorry, when Abraham heard God, he was just Abram, he was in Chaldea. All he did was hear a still small voice saying, get up and leave this place and go where I'll show you. Mm -hmm. He didn't get directions. He didn't get a map. He didn't get money for his journey. He didn't get anything except a simple instruction to get up and go and to leave his mother and father's house. But he did it. Well, I would submit to you that God probably said that to a lot of people about that same time period. And he ends up in the scriptures because he did it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But he didn't see God until he got to the promised land. You know? Now here's my premise for lots of people. There's a spot on the earth that God has created for you and your house. And on that spot, the value is not the trees or the resources that are in it or the land value or the dwellings or buildings that have been built on it. The value is on that spot, his father has designed it as an inheritance for you and your house, and the highest benefit on that is you have an open heaven on that spot. Someone else will not, but you and your house will because he designed that place for you. So he can allow every man, woman, and child in the earth to find him, to connect with him easily with an open heaven. But for the majority of the earth in the last couple of hundred years especially, we have separated millions of people from the place that God wants them to have. Mm. And we've sent them on journeys to the wrong direction. You know, So adversity may tr do that. Uh, distress may do that. War will displace people. We end up with refugees somewhere and then we resettle them permanently and we don't think about God wanting them to come back where they were born. So we see this pattern in the Jews where it's not just about the Jews because he loves them more than anybody else. He, he's trying to give us a blueprint, say this is what it looks like when you come into covenant with me. I, I carve out a place on the earth for you to encounter me and to know me and to make covenant. 
And on that spot, I will always hear your prayers. I will always respond to you. If you get separated from me, or if you break covenant, or if you defile that land, I may drive you out for a while, but then I will bring you back because you have to learn how to follow the prescription. The blueprint is there. And if you don't want to walk in it, it's going to be trouble for you. But if you want to walk in it, you're going to know your maker and you're going to Mm. be under the blessing of heaven. And the land gets the blessing too. So why does the world, why does the word of God say that the earth itself groans and travails? That's real. It's groaning and travailing right now, waiting for the manifestation of the full-grown sons of God. It's not just waiting for you to show up. It's waiting for you to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, talk like Jesus, do things that only God can do. That's what releases it from its groaning. Now, what happens if my inheritance is a spot that someone else is dwelling on, or maybe somebody built a city on it, and I wasn't involved. You know. Think about Damascus, for instance. I'm not saying that this is my inheritance, but just for example, if I came to the little town of Damascus, Maryland, and God said to me, this is your inheritance, I'd go, well, I've not been here. I don't know why this is my spot. I don't know any history in my household that has any connection with here. And look, there's already a city here. So how can I inherit something that someone else has the title to? Well, it has nothing to do with the real estate rules that we follow. It has to do with stewardship, not ownership. So if God says that's yours, you don't take it away from everybody else. You get to steward over it by crying out to God on it and asking for his kingdom to come. And he answers your prayers. Mm. Well, now that city is going to get transformed because he allows you to to have power with him to transform what he has set aside for you in your house. Mm -hmm. So when Israel started figuring that out, there were other nations there, and they drove them out. And why did they drive them out? According to the text, it's because they defiled the land. They were they were they were warring with God. They were idolaters. They were they were in, shedding innocent blood. They were doing everything contrary to the way God had designed them. So He wasn't driving them out because He was being mean to them. He was driving them out because they wouldn't repent and they were defiling His land. Mm-hmm. You know? Same rules apply when people groups today mess up the land. They generally lose it. That's the history of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one example that I, I lived out a few years ago, I went to Detroit, and I love that city. It's one of the most beautiful cities in America, but it looks like rubble now. Mm-hmm. It's a mess. Lots of people just don't want to live there anymore. Mm-hmm. And yet it used to be the city, it used to be called the city that built America. Mm-hmm. You know? It was the Industrial Revolution happened there. Of course, we know it as the car stuff, but it was more than just that. It was inventions and all kinds of amazing things that, that built that city. When you look at that as, a, as a, a place where God wants us to have refuge with him and learn how to build his kingdom, that's what the anointing of that city is for. But because of defilement, it spits the people out. They can't survive. They can't prosper. The factories are failing. The things are breaking down. And it's because we're out of sync with God's plan for the city. In some places, it's a prosperous city, but still out of sync. But that's temporary. God lets it go for a certain period. And if we don't repent, if we don't deal with some stuff, then we get into trouble. And when we get into trouble, then we usually call out to God for help. But what we've not understood, uh, I mean, most of the American Christians have not understood the rules for inheritance in the scriptures. So we, we don't realize that God has a place on the earth that he wants my family to find him at and to know him at. Well, here's the benefit. When Abraham found that spot, he didn't really build a city. He lived in a tent his whole life, but he went from place to place in that land and everywhere he camped it looks like almost everywhere that he stopped and hung out at he had a face-to-face encounter with God he never had that in Chaldea never all he got in Chaldea was a word from God one word from God that he obeyed 
But in the promised land, the land of his inheritance, he has multiple face-to-face encounters with the one that made him. You know, so much so that he enters into a place of blessing that has imparted to every nation of the world. What is up with that? I mean, wow. One single man touched God on such a level that every single human being in the earth today is benefiting from his blessing. On some level, mm-hmm. God, God did something massive through his obedience of saying, I'm going to go find my inheritance. And when I find it, I'm going to figure out how to, how to worship God on it. You know? Now, he becomes Abraham when he discovers his inheritance. And in this, it's funny, there's a wicked king there. Well, I say wicked. He, he appears to be wicked, but his name was Abimelech. And uh, his kingdom was not necessarily building the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. But Abraham's only got about 300 people. And here's a kingdom, a massive, thriving kingdom, a nation in the earth. And they become so afraid of Abraham that they make a treaty with him, a treaty of peace, because they knew he knew God and they Mm -hmm. feared. They're, They're afraid of the little clan in the tent because they know the living God. Where's that today? Why don't we have a massive increase of that because we've got Jesus dwelling inside us. Yeah. You know? When I look, began looking at that kind of stuff, I realized that that was not just because Abraham was an extraordinary human being. It was because he had found his inheritance. The benefits of knowing the spot on the earth that God has designed for you unlock the things that you were created for. And if you're disconnected from it, You can pray, you can find God, you can still discover some things, you can probably live up to what your purpose may be, but there's a level of it that cannot um, release and excel and prosper because you're not in the right spot. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean God won't bless you, He'll, he'll bless you to get you there. Now, when I started thinking about this, I started realizing that Fort Worth seemed like something happened there I mean, I'm in my 30s when I started to ponder this. I realized there was something happened in Fort Worth that God initiated. I didn't. You know, he introduced himself to me as a child. Maybe Fort Worth has something special about it for me. You know, I didn't think about moving there. It wasn't a city that was attractive to me at the moment. But I started thinking maybe there's maybe my father going there had a benefit that I haven't understood. So I went and sat down in the gate of the city and said, Jesus, talk to me about this place. You know, he said, well, this is part of your inheritance. I heard that immediately without any hesitation. Well, what do you want me to do with it? Should I buy a house here? No, you don't need to do that yet. Well, do I need to dwell here if it's my inheritance? You can if you want to. But what I really want you to understand is how to pray for it because now that you know that it's a place I want to give to you, I will answer your prayers on behalf of this place. That's called stewardship, not ownership. To this day, I don't own a house in Fort Worth, but I'm engaged with many of the churches, with the government, with the city, with the community. Every time I go there, something miraculous happens. Mm. It's just... <clears throat> It's just an amazing thing. Well, then uh, one other city that jumped out along the way after I figured out that Fort Worth might be part of my own inheritance, I I said to the Lord, I said, Jesus, I'm now 40 years old, and I've never felt like I was home. Uh, You know, ever since you introduced yourself, heaven's been more real to me than the earth. I've never felt home. I've got a nice house that I live in. I've got a wonderful family. How come I don't feel like I'm home? You know, I've got nothing to complain about. You know, and the Lord said to me, um, "It's because your inheritance has been separated from your house for many generations." You know, and I needed you to understand these principles before I could take you back there. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I'm ready to go. I want to find it. And so I went to Israel, and uh, 
my first trip to Israel, I showed up on my birthday, which is October 7th, and it was that year the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. I didn't know what the Feast of Tabernacles really was. I had never celebrated it, but it was quite extraordinary to, to enter into that land and go to a whole city celebrating a feast with the Lord. You know, Two and a half million people had come to Jerusalem that year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles along with everybody that always already lived there. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible experience for me. And I didn't understand it, but I thought it was amazing. And then I went to a little city called Hebron. You know, at the time I went to Hebron, I had a, a dream and the Lord had told me to go there. I didn't know much about Hebron. I knew it was mentioned in scripture but I really didn't think about it near as often as I had Jerusalem or Israel itself. And Hebron at that point was already a part of the West Bank, and it was not easy to just come and go there, but Jesus told me to go there. So I went, and uh, when I stepped off the bus, uh, I found the city in rubble. It was a war zone. Both sides were shooting at each other. There was bullets fired while I was there. I had to take a bulletproof bus just to get into the city. Everyone on the Israel side said, don't go there. It's dangerous for tourists. And uh, if you go there, you may not be able to get back into the state of Israel. And I was like, well, I don't care. Jesus told me to go. And so I went. And when I stepped out and I saw nothing but rubble, I thought, man, this city is, is a, a mess. Like everything valuable has been blown up. Why are people even living here? Mm -hmm. And suddenly I got quiet. And I stood there for a minute just trying to figure out what do you want me to do next, Lord? And I felt this level of peace that I had never had except when I was in the presence with God. I was like, Jesus, you're standing here in this spot. What are we doing? He said, son, this is your inheritance. You feel home now. You know? I'm like, well, why is it rubble? You know? I mean, it could have been a nice place to live. It's not right now. But I was marveled that I felt more home there than anywhere I'd ever been in the earth, and yet it was such a mess. Mm -hmm. you know? And then the Lord said to me, I'll answer your prayers here. So what do you want to do for this city? I'm like, well, I'd be nice they'd stop shooting each other. Yeah. be nice if I could go sit in the field of Abraham and not worry about somebody messing with me I'd like to drink the water and taste the fruit of the land and I'd like to pray whatever you're praying Jesus yeah. I'll make a long story short I don't want to get into all the details but I ended up meeting the mayor on the Palestinian side and the rabbi on the Jewish side and and I said to both of them this city needs to be a city of peace and somehow we got to figure out this inheritance problem you know because the Jews say this is our land because God gave it to us and the Palestinians say well we were here first God gave us this land too and the truth is they're both wrong mm. you know because God owns the earth and the fullness thereof, and he has not given it away. He allows you to live on it. He gives you the stewardship of it. I don't care what your title looks like in the courthouse of America. Mm -hmm. The earth is still the Lord's. Mm -hmm. you, you have rights in our land with the laws that we've created, but your rights stop when God changes. You know, if he doesn't want you there, you're going to be leaving soon. You know? I don't care how much power you have, you can't overthrow the will of God. So God owns the earth mm -hmm. and the fullness thereof. That's all the resources. He's just so generous and so phenomenally amazing that he allows us to benefit from the things he owns without arguing with us too much until we defy him or disobey him or decide that we don't want to do some of the things that he would like. When we become his enemy, we lose all of our rights. Yeah. Doesn't matter how much power a nation has, they get they cease to exist when they decide that they can overthrow the living God. 
And our nation right now is crumbling on the precipice mm. of either a move of God or utter calamity. Mm. You know, all the things that we've uh, benefited in the couple of hundred years of being a nation could come to a sudden end if we decide not to bow our knee to the King of Kings. And his kingdom is rapidly approaching. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I stood in the rubble, I met 600 IDF soldiers that were risking their life to try to keep peace in that city. And I started buying cups of coffee from a little Arab tea shop some tea, some coffee, because I didn't know which one they'd like. So I, I would go to that little shop and buy one of each, and then I'd take it to some of the soldiers and ask them which one they wanted. And I would ask them, how can I pray for the peace of this city? You know, you're here to try to keep it in the natural. I'm here to change it in the spirit because it's my inheritance. You know? So how can I help you do what you're called to do? Mm. I don't need you to protect me. God sent me to call out to him that your life would be considered precious, that the war would stop, that you somehow there's an answer to this problem. You know? And every single one of them, when they accepted it, not all of them did, but most of them accepted the coffee or the tea, and they were very grateful that someone was praying for them and knew that they were there risking their life. And most, most tourists don't do this. They avoid those kinds of places. Well, then I got to meet the leaders of the Palestinians, and I said to them that uh, they had no right to ask for this land or to demand that this land be given to them until God had answered that question and they had come into covenant with him. Mm -hmm. If he said it belongs to them, then who are we to defy him? Mm -hmm. But if you don't want to have covenant with him, you can't make a claim to his land. And the same thing I said to the Jews that I met, that it is legitimate to say somewhere back there God made a covenant with Abraham and he gave him the stewardship of this land. But if you defile it, mm -hmm. if you break covenant with God, what right do you have mm -hmm. to claim that it's yours now? You know? Your only rights are in the covenant. You must come back into the covenant. And if you rejected the king, you're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. You don't even know his name. You don't mm -hmm. think he's the real king. You're looking for another. And I've seen his face. Mm -hmm. I know he's real. You know? And every, every single person I encountered humbled themselves and said, man, we've never heard it put like this, but you're right. God does own this. We do need to connect with him again. What do we do? Well, ask for covenant. Ask for him to reveal himself to you. Let's bless the land and let's bless his name. And then let's see what he does for us to settle these political problems. Mm -hmm. Right now, because there's a war going on over there, I can tell you the war is uh, as bad as I've ever seen it. Um, and it's tragic what's happening. But from a spiritual perspective, if you defile the land, you lose the land. And the best way, the, the, the worst, it's, it's bad, but it's the quickest way to defile the land is to shed innocent blood on it. You know? So right now we're going to see some massive transformation in that part of the world, and it's, it looks really bad. It's in the news every day. But here's what I, I'm very troubled by. Israel, or the, the land of Israel, not talking about the state of Israel, I'm talking about the land, mm -hmm. is a microcosm of the whole earth. Think of it like a puzzle where God takes a piece from every nation in the world and he has put a little piece there. And what happens there reproduces in the rest of the earth. So we were looking at war in that little piece called Israel. Mm. Eretz Israel has bloodshed, innocent bloodshed on it. It's getting ready to spread to the rest of the earth if we don't humble ourselves and call out to our maker and ask for the terms of peace that we need to come back into with God. Yes. Nations of the earth now must make peace with God, and they must figure out how to come into covenant with him. Wow. Now, the last thing that's important is that is I, I discovered a mystery, and I, I don't have a complete answer for this, but I just want to throw it out for people to consider. In the New Testament, when they 
when they birthed the, the first church in the upper room, we have these disciples, the 120 of them, that went into that spot after the resurrection, and Jesus told them, go there and pray until you're endued with power. Mm. So they did that. And the, according to the text in Acts, it says they came into one mind, one heart, and one accord, and they prayed together. Now, that's not a 501c3 organizational meeting. That's not a church denominational meeting. Mm -hmm. That's not a, a family saying we're going to do something extraordinary. That is a bunch of people that had to lock themselves in a room until they learned to love each other on a level that they were in one heart and one mind and one accord. Mm. That is very difficult to do because we tend to like people when we got a little bit of distance, but you throw us all into one room with one bathroom and no showers and no beds and nowhere to, to be comfortable and nowhere to get away from the rest of it, it's hard to love some people. Mm -hmm. But they were required to gain something with one another before the power of God came down. Mm -hmm. One heart, one mind, one accord. Those are the foundations for a move of God. Yeah. And then God adds himself to those things. When we, when we are willing to love each other that way, when we're willing to hold on to one another, when we value every person that he made instead of just the ones we like, then he comes to inhabit that and he rains his power down upon us and tongues of fire set upon us and he graces us with an anointing to save the city. You know? So when they came out of that, You've got to understand when you read the scriptures carefully, you see this, that out of that 120, the majority of them were women and children. You know, the average family in that day had seven to eight kids. So if you had 70 disciples and their families, there was more kids in that room than there was adults. When the fire set upon them, you know, he set upon them all. And they all, spoke with a language that they had not done before. Mm -hmm. And they, went, they all went into the streets with power. Mm -hmm. This was why Peter realized what was going on. This is fulfilling the prophecy of Joel. Look, even your handmaids, your sons and daughters are prophesying. Even the hand, servants and handmaidens, he's poured out his spirit upon us all. That we reduced the distinction to the clergy or to the spiritual, or to the mighty, or to the strong, or to the, the, you know, the most able leaders in the bunch. God just disqualified everybody and required them all to come into one mind, one accord, and one heart. And then he gave to everybody the same level of his grace. Now, they did different things when they came out. So, yeah, we need leaders, and yeah, we need you know, the apostles and prophets and pastors and all those things. But they emerged from that place of power with God. They didn't get that at seminary and then try to teach us how to get the power. Mm. We, we should get the power back in the body of Christ, yes. and then everything that God needs to function is going to come out of mm. that. You know? So it, when they gave birth to this, the earth had never seen a temple like that one, because it was a temple that wasn't made with hands. It was not a building with an address. Mm. It was hearts that he inhabited, yes. and not just one heart. It was 120 hearts that he inhabited and formed into a body that had never been seen like that before. That's a first fruit of eye has not seen and ear has not heard the things that I have prepared for my people. Mm -hmm. That's the first fruit of what Jesus is going to do, I believe, in our day. Mm -hmm. Something that they didn't even know how to do. He had to enable them to do it. But when they came out, the word says that they turned the city upside down. They shook the world with the, with the good news. And all they did was live. All they did was live with the king. But here's the mystery. When Jesus was resurrected, the first thing we see in Scripture is the women went to the tomb, or some of the women went to the tomb to just, I think they, you know, when you're grieving, you, you make kind of stupid decisions. You don't know what to do, so you're just grieving. The tomb, the, the, the stone could not be rolled away 
but they still got some stuff. They thought, maybe we can go wash this body. Maybe we can just go. They just wanted to touch him one more time. They loved him, and they just wanted to touch him one more time. And yet they probably knew they couldn't roll that stone away. You know? So they were wasting their time with what they wanted to do, and God didn't need it because he was already alive. What he needed is someone to witness the power of resurrection. Mm. And so the stone's already rolled away. The soldiers have fled. Angels are hanging around just to let them know what's going on. And then when they see Jesus, here's the mystery. They didn't know who he was. These are women, which probably included the mother of Jesus. How? Did they not recognize him? They had been with him night and day for at least three and a half years, some of them longer than that, among his own household. The disciples, when they ran to the tomb and they saw it empty, and then later he appears to them, how come they didn't recognize him? Mm -hmm. you know, every single appearance in the book of Acts where Jesus showed up after the resurrection, his own friends and family did not know who he was until he opened their eyes. Mm. So I'd submit to you, here's our problem right now. We know Jesus as a Savior. We probably know him a little bit as a Lord. You know, we've prayed that way at least. We use that term. But we do not understand his character and nature as a king. If he shows up as a king, we don't even know it's him. Mm. We can't recognize him that way until he calls out our name and we hear his voice, and then you can't, I mean, I know him by his voice. Mm. I know him by he says my name like no one else ever says. It's endeared with love and grace. No one says Timothy like Jesus mm. does. But I can't see him in the natural. I can't understand what he's going to do or what he wants to do as a king until he opens my eyes. You know? And we have... We have put our faith, if you'll bear with me a little bit, we put our faith in a gospel that has been truth but somewhat limited. Mm -hmm. you know? So when somebody told me that I'm a sinner and that I need to repent and ask God to forgive me, that he will forgive me, and then I can ask him to uh, be my Lord and, and he will do that, and I can ask him to come into my heart and he will do that, and I'm, I can ask him to fill me with his Holy Spirit and he will do that, but that's still limited in a way we've not understood because now my faith, even though I'm just a brand new believer, my faith is in only what I've heard. And he's so much bigger than that. Right. You know? He doesn't want to just be your savior. He wants to be your king. He doesn't just want to rescue you from your sins. He wants to return you to who you really are. He wants to restore you to what he created you to be. Mm. And then he wants to empower you in a way that you're going to do supernatural things that have, you've never done before mm. because he's not going to be in you. You know, mm. He doesn't want you to just believe in, in him. Mm -hmm. He wants to move in and make you his home. And from within, Christ in me, my hope of glory, you know, we're all sort of praying for a move of God, but we've not understood that I have put my faith in what he did for me, and I need to increase my faith to understand what he now wants to do in me. You know? mm. So Christ in me, he doesn't want to be known in the heavens. He wants to be known in you. you know? oh, he's a heavenly God, too. He wow. sits on a throne. But somehow he enabled you to sit on his right hand and you enabled him to come and sit in you. you know? And we need to understand those two things because I have limited the power of God because I only put my faith in his forgiveness mm. instead of in his dwelling within me. Mm. You know? 
And I have limited myself in the spiritual realm because I want God to come and help me do whatever I'm doing. I don't know that at this very moment I'm sitting down at his right hand. What am I doing there that I'm completely oblivious to at this moment? Because I can't even see it. I can't even taste the food that the angels eat. I can't even open my eyes and see the angels. They're, they're hidden to me. They're not hidden to you because he doesn't want to show them. They're hidden because you put your faith in forgiveness instead of the indwelling of your maker. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, please understand, I'm not trying to correct you. I'm saying we need to enlarge our understanding of what Jesus did for us, Amen. you know. He didn't just save me to fix my sins. He saved me to build the kingdom of yes. God on the earth and to sit with him in the heavens and understand what he's doing on a minute-by-minute -minute basis in the power of the universe. Yes. Wow, that's so much bigger than little old me thought, you know. I just wanted a nice lunch today with Jesus. I didn't know that I was able to sit in the kingdom's throne. Well, that's the evidence of Scripture if you just put your faith in what God has said. Amen. So when I, when I discovered that, I said, Jesus, I really i am so thankful for the encounters that I've had. Yeah. And I'm so thankful for you, you know, making yourself known to me. But I, I'm a little out of touch with what we're doing in the heavenly realms. Mm -hmm. you know? I know what I'd like to see you do here. But I'm not sure I wake up every morning and sit down at your right hand and have a sense of what are we going to do now? You know, How short of your glory am I because I don't even think about that? Mm. And th th his response was this. He said, how big are you? I was like, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little, little bigger than I'd like to be <laughs> <laughs> in some parts of my body. But <laughs> he said, no, I mean your spirit. How big are you? Yeah. At this given moment, you're able to sit on the earth in one of your favorite prayer spots and talk to me. And at the same time, you're sitting at my right hand. Timothy, how big are you? Wow, I don't know. Um, it's not being in two places at once. It's being in both places at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know? So... I was like, Jesus, I don't know the answer to that. You know? He said, in me dwells the whole universe. Yeah. And you're in me. Yeah. And in you, the Godhead of the universe has moved in. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you're the seat of my throne. Mm. You know? You're where I wanted to lay my head from the beginning of time. <laughs> we, we didn't just get restored from our sins. Mm. We got an upgrade. We've got something Adam didn't get. Adam got his breath. We get Christ himself. Mm. You know? Adam became a living soul. We have our spirit made alive in him, and he brings all the goodies of heaven to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, what I need to figure out how to do with my prayers is how to release the presence of God from within me by just doing whatever I see him doing and saying what I hear him saying and, and engaging with him on a level where I can get to know him like that. And if you're not feeling like you're doing that now, don't don't get don't get too discouraged. That's what's available. And the good news is God wants to make that easy on all of us. You know? But we need his help to do it. Yes. And so the first thing we have to do is sort of get saved. <laughs> this sounds a little funny, but maybe I need to get saved. Like really save this time. I'm, I, I don't want mm. people to misunderstand me, but the, but I put my faith in a limited gospel instead of the fullness of the good mm. news. You know, the fullness is you've not just been forgiven, you've been made a joint heir, and you've been given a place at the right hand, and Christ dwells in you now. Timothy, I, I feel led to ask you to actually, you know, pray. Um, 
over our audience. I was actually going to ask you that at the end, like to end the show. I was, I was, that's what I was going to ask you to do. And I feel exactly what you're talking about right now. If you can honestly pray over us in the audience of yeah. coming into this, what you're speaking of. Uh, I want to, I want to do that. And that's certainly why we're here. Um, I want to answer one little thing that I think is really important yeah, just for the audience yeah. too. Yes. Um, what does the kingdom of God look like? Mm. You know, uh, the, the the word of God says you, you you can't comprehend it with the outer appearance or by what things that people say. That the kingdom is within you. Now it's not supposed to stay within you. It's supposed to come out and change the world. Mm. You know? But what I just described, Christ in me, is the kingdom of God. That I if I can wrap my heart around that. And put my faith in the head. That's what God really did when I said, Jesus, would you save me? Yeah. Now, from that place of his throne, let's build what he wants to build. Let's do what he wants to do. Let's let him be our king. Let's let him transform our city. Let's let him transform our, our, our neighborhood, our family, our friends. You know, What can I do for the king? You know? I can tell you what I believe is going to happen in this territory that I, part of I, what I was sent here for was to pray for some things that haven't been prayed for, but it doesn't mean that the things you have been praying for are not right or not good. It just God's just adding something to it. Mm. You know? So everybody that's out there praying, please keep doing it and do more. But here's something he's adding to it. Every man, woman, and child in this territory is about to have an encounter with God. You know? And then they're going to have to make a decision mm -hmm. on whether they'll be a part of his kingdom or not. You know? and especially the children. Jesus is about to do something sovereign with the children in this territory. You know? It's just like what he did in the New Testament when they brought the children to him and he was blessing them. Some of the adults thought that he needed to stop doing that because they thought he was the king and the kids were pestering him. Mm. And the truth is that's exactly what he wanted to do because he needed the joy and the laughter of those children right then at that moment because he already knew he was headed to the cross. Mm. And that laughter of a child, that joy of play, it sustained him to the cross. Yeah. So this is what I saw, and this is what I began praying for this territory before I came. I saw Jesus playing with your children like he played with them in the scriptures. We don't understand that he was playing with them because the, the text in English says that he was blessing them. But what is blessing a child? You know, Do you not bless a child when you make them laugh? Do you not bless the child when you call out their name? Do not bless a child when you tell them you love them. He was doing all that. Mm. But what I saw him doing was throwing them up in the air, swinging them around, rolling in the grass with them, calling out their names and telling them what he created them for. He was blessing them in play on a level we don't understand because we've kind of forgot how to play in the house of God. Mm -hmm. But the children haven't forgotten. And we often think that they're not being spiritual when they're playing, but Jesus wants to play with our kids and he wants to gift to them their identity and his blessing. Mm. So he's going to visit the children of this region. He's gonna show his face to many of them and he's gonna visit them mostly in the night. They're gonna dream dreams and they're gonna have some visions. Mm -hmm. And he's going to tell them who they are and what he created them for, just like he did this little two-year-old mm -hmm. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And when that starts happening here, which is what I want to pray, you're going to have to understand how to respond to that as moms and dads and aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas because your kids are about to step into the glory. You know? mm -hmm. Will you also? You, know? you can take it from them. Or you can step into it with them. Mm. Yeah. But those same kids that Jesus blessed in the field later were standing at the east gate, and they were the first ones to say Hosanna to the king when he was riding in on the donkey. Mm -hmm. 
He knew they were going to be there when he was playing with them in the field. And just as this city and this territory, when the king begins to fully manifest himself for his kingdom, your children are going to greet him at the gates. They're going to be the first voices calling out to him because they're going to know he's their king. And we've got to come to Jesus with a shift in our understanding now that he's not building a church. He's not building just a family. He's building a kingdom. A church is in his kingdom. A family is in his kingdom. A cities and nations are in his kingdom. But what he's doing is so much bigger than what we have understood. Mm. So we've got to release the Spirit of God to do everything that he wants and celebrate life on a level we've never known before. Mm. My prayer then is this, that all the listeners, yes. not just today, but the ones that hear this later, mm. they, you're going to have access to the heavens. You know, and to the children that are listening, call out to Jesus and call him your king, and he will answer you. And you're going to see his face just like Timothy did. You know? And when you do, whatever he says to you, pay attention and do it. You know? The last thing is, Marilyn, in your name, is Mary land, a place where God wants to marry his people again, yeah. a place where you will give birth to the power of God to release for the kingdom of heaven to come down and be visible on the earth again. Just like one day back there a long time ago you helped create the United States, now the kingdom of heaven is calling upon the anointing of this region to give birth to what Jesus, your maker, wants. So, Father, I call out to you. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. You lifted up your right hand and you swore to your son to give him a name above every name, to increase his glory and honor and majesty to give him the inheritance and, and at his request he made us joint heirs with him. And in hearing your oath, he answered back, oh, that you would let them be in you as I have been in you, that you would be in them as you have been in me. I call for the prayer that our king prayed in the last chapter of John. And he asked you to do that as his father. And I know he always gets his prayers answered. Mm. So from this spot on the earth, I ask you to lift up your hand again, not because you did not finish it, not because you have not done it. Everything that you say is established. But lift it up again over this state and answer his prayer in this place. Answer the prayer of our King in this place. Let the cloud of Father come down upon Maryland. Let the bushes burn again and not be consumed. Let the mountains shake at your voice. Let the trees clap their hands let the grass of the field give you a wave offering. Let the birds sing unto you as their maker. Cause all of creation in this area to wake up right now and to respond to the king that you swore your oath to, O Abba Father. And out of the spirit of man, out of my heart where I know my king dwells. I ask you to release the anointing that will settle the matters in this place, that will fix what is falling short, that will make up for the things that we have left behind, that will restore what has been forgotten. Shine your light on the ancient paths. Be a lamp unto our feet. Take us by the hand.
and lead us where we have not known how to go or where to go. And I pray right now, Jesus, put your fingers in the ears of the listeners and open their hearing to the activity that proceeds out of the heavenly realms and out of your lips. Put your hand on their eyes and open their eyes like you did for your disciples and for the women and the children in the first generation. And they then saw you and knew you were the king. Open our eyes also that we might see you and that we might know you. Reach into our hearts as we're listening. I ask you with your mighty hand to reach into our hearts and take out the stony hearts and give us back a pure heart of flesh. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let that blessing fall upon the men, women, and children of this place. Let it be said of this region that they know the living God there. We pray for a move of God now. Heavens, open in the name of my King. Earth, hear the word of the Lord and open up for the feet of our Maker. And I say to the heavens and the earth, rejoice in this hour and make yourself ready. For I've come as a herald saying the king is coming and he's at the door now. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. To every man, woman, and child, I leave you with this. Call out to him to save you to transform you, to remake you into what you were created for. Ask for your household, not just yourself. Ask for your city. He's a generous God. Even ask for the nations and they will be given to you as an inheritance. And then I pray, O oh God, would you send the angel of the Lord that guarded the gates, the one in whom your name is in, the one that went with Moses, the one that went with Abraham. Would you send that angel and the whole host of heaven that come with them mm. to Maryland? Would you become a wall of fire around Franklin and Damascus and the surrounding cities? I, I can name them all. You choose what you want. You manifest where you want, but become the wall of fire that you promised. Watch over us and consider our lives precious. In the days and hours ahead, we don't know how the nations will go, but we know how it will go with you. So I pray that you would pull us into the place of refuge. And I call you the, the Savior, the Master, the King, and the one that spreads your wings over Maryland and bring the people under your refuge. Protect them in times of trouble. Answer them when they call out to you. And I say to the earth, hear, O earth, for this you were made, for this hour you were born. Call out to your maker along with us. Let the voice of the rocks be heard. In the day of my king, if the children didn't cry out, the rocks would have. But in this day, I ask for the children to cry out again, Hosanna to the king, and let the rocks answer him also. But I lift up a gift of faith to you, O King of Kings. This little thing that you've done with me, it was just enough to teach me how to love what you love and pray what you pray. So I ask you with faith for every man, woman, and child in Maryland, 
Don't leave one of them out. Save them all for your name's sake. Rescue them, O oh God, and make yourself known to them. Shake the heavens and the earth again in our day and let your mercy and your grace reign upon the earth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Timothy Bentz, uh, we really appreciate you, you know, taking the time, man, to be here today. Um, it's just been a, it's a true gift as well to just have you here, you know, to hear these words. And I know you're just speaking, you know, where, where the Lord's leading you, but just a gift to, you know, ourselves in the audience of someone who just, we've just been such in big respect of you. And the Bible does speak of honor, and we just truly do honor you and what you've been doing for the kingdom, man. And, you know, just to the audience, you know, he was at the barn last night and uh, then got up this morning, you know, uh, spoke, had a couple services. Then from there, you know, it's just been nonstop for you, brother, to be honest with you. And, you know, people are, you know, just constant in constant contact with him right now. And he took the time to come to the studio today to drive 20 minutes to do this with us today. So it's, it's, it's just a, a big treat for us and a gift. And then he goes from here back to speak to uh, some, 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 uh, the youth at uh, Difference Makers. Mm -hmm. So uh, guys, this is Timothy Benz. He's got, you know, other podcasts out there as well. We're just speaking on all types of topics. And uh, if you're looking for more, just look up that name and find more of that. But I know, you know, I, I don't speak for him, but I know his main focus is on all of us just focusing on the one true Messiah, you know, Jesus Christ. So you guys have been hit hard by that. Please feel free to reach out with any questions, anything that you guys just need in terms of what can lead you to what we're speaking of today. Um, <laughs> Ryan, any other things before we get off here today, brother? Uh, I, got, I got nothing, bro. Mm, it really is like that, huh? Guys, this was The Septic Show. Thank you for tuning in to another awesome episode. Thanks to Doug of Lever Dreams for making this happen. And, uh, guys, we are people that say we're praying for you, and we really are. God bless. <laughs>